Part 3 Chapter 9 Secrets In engineering space, the banks of equipment blink steadily. Come on, sit over here. Benny points to a spot on one of the small workbenches. Very well, the bot says, sitting down on the slightly too small bench. Its small secondary arms twitch slightly, fidgeting. Benny starts getting things ready. So, you know where you used to work, but don't recall why you were in the crate or what led to your being in the crate or how you got off of your ship? I am afraid that is correct. I do not. The last thing I remember... The last thing I remember is... The last thing... The bot tilts his head. I do not know the last thing I remember... There is plenty of large segments of corrupted memory blocks. The corruption is near the encrypted blocks. That is interesting. Benny reaches out to access the front panel on Gabe's torso. You're telling me! Gabe tilts his head. Telling you what? Benny shakes his head. Well, you obviously have a secret. Those are always exciting but it sure looks like you're connected to whatever Maxim and Zephyr found out about the Peacekeepers and their plans to mess everything up in the sector so they can make more money and take over. Grow lacking Krebnax, I hate Peacekeepers. He jumps up and down. So exciting! Why do you hate the Peacekeepers? They serve a noble purpose, dedicating most of their population to helping keep order in the galaxy. Gabe looks down at Benny who is now attaching data cables to the open access panel on his chest. The terminal on the bench next to Gabe begins displaying diagnostic data. That's what they want you to think. The reality is they're bullies who've tricked the sector into thinking they're this wonderful organization that keeps everyone safe. Except they escort those that don't pay up directly, and they stomp all over everyone's privacy with no consideration whatsoever. They keep technology for themselves, so they always have an advantage. Plus, they do the bidding of the Tarsi first, above all else. Benny walks over to the terminal, still talking. They've destroyed entire colonies and not paid for it. They fake crimes so that they can kidnap people to feed their war machine. There are even rumors that the war with the Confederacy of Trib was started by the peacekeepers. To demonstrate their value before that last tax increase the Tarsi rolled out. Now, from what Zephyr and Maxim say, they're doing it again or at least trying. Grabnax. I had no idea. The engineers I worked with seemed so nice. Gabe turns to look at Benny, his optic sensors spinning to focus on the small hacker. Are you and the crew going to stop them? Benny looks up. Beats me. I just met these Drenogs. Well, the two peacekeeper ones at least. I've known Will since he got the ghost. He doesn't seem to want to get involved, and I can't blame him. You don't last long out here fighting fights that aren't yours. It's the fastest way to suck vacuum, or blaster barrel, whichever is worse. Both sound like bad things. Benny looks at his terminal. Okay, let's see if I can't help you get your memories back, and maybe see what that doodad on your shoulder is. He watches the data scrolling by for a moment, frowning. What the? Gabe turns and said. What did you find? Someone dug around in your databanks and encrypted a day or so's worth of data. Immensely poorly, I might add. They botched it up real good, like they just took a chunk of memory and encrypted it in place, not bothering to copy it to another location or anything. No wonder you were having trouble. Can you affect the needed repairs? Benny looks over at Gabe. I won't take offense to that, since we just met. Thank you, I think. Gabe turns and stares at nothing. Benny continues to work for a few minutes, whistling a tune that's presumably popular on Braylek. There we go. He looks over at Gabe. I need to put you in sleep mode so that I can access the data. I think that's what they did wrong in the first place, messing with your memories while you were online. When I wake you up, everything should be integrated properly. Very well, Gabe says, entering power save mode. His optic sensor grows dark and his head droops forward. This is some grow lack drin right here, Benny says to himself. He reached for the comms panel on the wall. Hey, everyone, get down here. He gets back to work, furiously tapping commands into the console with one hand, while touching various parts of Gabe's insides with a probe. 
A few minutes later, Will, Zephyr, and Maxim enter the engineering space. What's up? Zephyr asks. You figure out its memory issues? Sure did, Benny nods. I just decrypted them and am reintegrating them into his main databank. Once he boots up, he'll have full access to whatever it was they wanted to block out. Benny looks up from his console. Ready? The Reveal With a few words and clicks, Gabe's optical sensors begin to light up. They spin and focus, and then the tall robot looks from face to face, before settling on Will. I remember now, it says. All of it. Will turns and opens the hatch behind him. Let's go back to the galley. I get the feeling this will warrant some coffee and maybe popcorn. He leaves the room and Zephyr follows. Maxim looks at Benny. What's popcorn? The hacker looks up at his much taller crewmate. Beats me. Come on, Gabe. When they are all seated around the galley table, a cup of coffee in Will's hand, he says, Okay, Gabe, let's hear it. The tall robot looks around. Very well. As I told you already, I am an engineering robot. I was assigned to the peacekeeper carrier Pax Magellanic in the main engineering compartment. I was assigned the task of deionizing several of the secondary purge systems, located in a smaller sublevel of engineering. It was there that I got into trouble. I was working on the third of my twelve purge valves when I heard voices. Usually... I would not have cared about that. Conversations took place all day in the engineering spaces. However, these voices weren't any that I had a voice print match for, meaning that they were not part of the engineering crew. As such, they were accessing locations and possibly systems they were not cleared for access. One of my secondary protocols is to protect the ship and its crew to the best of my ability. If there are saboteurs aboard, it is my duty to stop them. I stopped what I was doing, and I went to investigate. Will holds up a hand. Time out. He gets up and refills his cup. Anyone want some popcorn? He presses a few buttons on the food processor, and a bag of popcorn plunks out onto the tray. Sorry, Gabe, he says, sitting down again. Go on. He takes a handful of popcorn and passes the bag to Maxim. As I was... Oh my gods, this is delicious. Zephyr, try some. Maxim grabs another handful of popcorn, then passes the bag to his companion. He looks at Will. Your planet is full of wonders. Will nods. Truth. Zephyr takes a handful and hands the bag to Benny, who also reaches in, but not before licking all his fingers. He moves to hand the bag back to Will, who waves it away. Keep it, dude. So gross. Benny looks around. What? Gabe makes a coughing-type noise, or at least what it might sound like if a robot could cough. As I was saying, I followed the voices through the engineering space. While not as large as the main engineering compartment, secondary engineering spaces on board peacekeeper carriers are still quite large. I heard the conversation before reaching the speakers. They were talking of a plan to undermine the government of four different star systems, sowing dissonance through rebellions and encouraging neighbor systems to get involved. Once one or two of the systems erupted into chaos, the peacekeepers could come in, stabilize the region, and establish their presence in systems they've been unable to invade legally as yet. It seems like a rather well-thought-out plan. It occurred to me that perhaps it was best not to confront the perpetrators directly, but rather to report the issue to someone above me. Unfortunately, as that thought was processed, I accidentally kicked a pipe that some careless crew member had left laying in the walkway. I reached down to move it safely out of the way, and when I stood up, one of the perpetrators shot me. I assume it was a stunner, since the next time I came online, my diagnostics reported no physical damage yet I noted a lapse in my internal clock of four talks. Zephyr and Maxim look at Will. Will, this is related. This is proof of what we discovered. We can expose the plot. Will raises his hand to the quiet the table. Whoa, whoa, whoa. Let's all just take a breath here. I am not done with my story. Should I continue or... 
The others all fall silent. Will looks at Gabe. Yeah, keep going. Very good. As I said, when I came back online, I was undamaged, except that I could not move. My motor control systems had been disabled. One of the men I had observed plotting was in the room, as was a peacekeeper ensign. They were discussing disposing of me. The first man was of higher rank, a commander. The last words the man said to the ensign, Just get rid of the bot. It better not exist by morning. And then he left. I never saw the man again. Neither person seemed to realize I was back online. Oh, gods, this is grotesque. What did they do? Zephyr is leaning forward, a rather horrified look on her face. Thankfully for me, the ensign had other plans. From what I overheard, he owed someone large sums of money and was able to broker a deal selling me and the data I contained to that party. Zarex's competitor, I assume, Will offers. Possibly. The ensign never used a name. All I overheard was negotiation. The ensign was to trade me and the data I recorded about the coup and some modifications, which explains this, he says, touching the modification on his shoulder, in exchange for the wiping clean of his debt. Shortly after that, the ensign encrypted my data banks, not realizing I was online. That would explain the degradation. Gabe looks around the room. The next thing I recall is being activated inside a crate in your cargo hold. The Deal After two days of FTL, the ghost is entering the Falor system, home of the planet Malkor. Everyone is on the bridge, including Gabe. Are you sure about this, Will? We can turn around, find work, I don't know, somewhere. Zephyr is sitting at her station, looking concerned. Yeah, there's no getting around it. If we screw Zarex, finding work will be next to impossible. At least work that doesn't turn our stomachs. I don't mind bounty hunting, but I'm not getting into cartel work. Will is at his pilot station, guiding the ship down the gravity well towards Malkor. They are still a good hour out from the planet. Maxim is at the weapons management console. Do you think you will accept the deal you plan to offer him? Will shrugs. I don't know. He's not a complete psychopath or anything, so he can be reasoned with. I've had to negotiate my way out of trouble with him before. But yeah, this is a big one. We don't know what he agreed to load Gabe up with. And Gabe can't access those systems without the passcodes the ensign is supposed to provide on payment. Payment he isn't going to get now. He shrugs again. Anyway, here's the plan once we get down there. Will looks at each member of his crew. Zephyr, you and Benny are tackling his shopping list. He looks at Benny. Yeah, I don't trust you, not one bit, even a little. She'll control the money. You tell her what you need and sell her on it, and she'll pay. Zephyr, if you think he's bullshitting, don't pay. End of story, Benny. This job, even if it pays, won't be enough for everything as it is. He looks at Maxim. Which brings me to you, Max. Take Gabe and go grocery shopping. I've sent a list to your pad of things we need, things I'd like to have, and things that would be cool if you can get them cheaply. Gabe, who's standing near the back of the bridge by the hatch, chimes in. Are you certain it's a good idea for me to leave the ship? Yeah, I think it'll be okay. This will either work or not. Whether you're on the ship or out shopping, it probably won't matter much. You know, things were a lot easier when it was just the ghost and me, and I wasn't broke. Zephyr smiles. I think I speak for everyone here when I say we appreciate it. You've given literally all of us a new lease on life. She looks down at her console, which is beeping. Incoming comms from Malcor Space Control. Will turns to the primary display. On screen... The display switches from the stars to a gruff-looking Malkorite female. Incoming vessel, please identify yourself and state your purpose in the system. She sounds bored. Will smiles. Hi there. Malkor Space Control. This is the Millennium Falcon. We're a small cargo service here to drop off a crate for a customer and then look for some work taking us out the system. 
The bored Malkarite space control operator looks down at her console, then back up at the screen. Very well, Millennium Falcon. You're clear to approach and land at Gelnor Spaceport. Pad 42. Will still smiling. Gelnor Spaceport, Pad 42. Roger that. Malkor Space Control, see you soon. The space control operator tilts her head, then the screen goes blank. Will turns back to Zephyr. Send that info to the comms account we were given. On it. The ghost weaves its way through the traffic around Malkor, finding a spot in the approach line between two large mass cargo haulers. Thirty minutes later, they're burning through the upper atmosphere. Switching over to atmospheric engines, Will says as the main sublight engines disengage. There's a moment when everyone's stomach, except Gabe's, lurches slightly, before the boom of the atmospheric engines kicking in and the press of the forward motion returns. The Past Zelir is a binary star system composed mostly of gas giants, but sitting right in the gravitational sweet spot in Zelir Prime. It is a rocky world covered mainly by ocean. The civilization that originally dwelt on Zelir Prime is long since gone, leaving nothing behind but ruins and ghost stories. No one knows what happened to them. They were clearly a technologically advanced race, but they vanished, their world crumbling to pieces. Then the Holgians found it, the perfect world to create a base of operations for a crime syndicate. Hard to reach, mostly unknown and haunted, if you believe in that sort of thing. The Reaper is approaching a space station, or at least Will assumes that's what it is. He's never seen one, besides the International Space Station, and compared to that, this thing is a freaking Star Trek starbase. Langsham is in his chair. Will is leaning against the bulkhead by the hatch, and Rolo, Jax, and Olgo are all on their stations. So, who are the Holgians? Will asks. Jack turns from his station. Just the most dangerous crime syndicate in the sector. I'd list some of the things they're rumored to be guilty of, but I don't want to give you nightmares. No need to be rude. Will sticks his tongue out. Langsham glances back over his shoulders. Imagine the worst criminals your world has to offer, and multiply that by a hundred. They're involved in everything from slaves and drugs to weapons. The Reaper slides into a large landing bay next to another ship, only about half as big, but clearly a ship meant for fighting. Will lets out a low whistle. That looks mean. It's another Uncaran vessel. Earlier model than the Reaper, but no less mean. Even with the peacekeepers keeping the Ankarans on a short lease, the Holgians have quite a few of their best. Langsham stands, as on the forward display, a party is visible walking towards the ship. The lead Holgian is a hulking being. Will can't determine its sex from the screen, but it's huge and mean-looking. Sort of like a seven-foot-tall Triceratops sans tail. It's not wearing any armor or weapons that Will can see. But he supposes that makes sense if this station, and for that matter the entire planet below, are part of the criminal empire this being runs. Don Corleone didn't wear armor either. Slightly behind and to the right of the massive crime lord is another being, one Will knows only from the newscasts he's seen on the ship, a peacekeeper. Uh, hey, Langsham, isn't that a peacekeeper? Will asks. Will, you stay on the ship. The captain raises his hand to stop Will's protest. The Holgians would exploit your world in a heartbeat, and if they find out I have a human on my crew, they'll demand I turn you over. That peacekeeper down there won't help, and will likely do what he can to hide the complete enslavement of your people from his superiors and the GC. What? Will asks. Enslavement? Why? How? The captain looks at him levelly. Do you really want to find out? Will slumps down in the nearest chair. Fine. There is one thing you can do. Our agreement states that they pay on delivery. The transfer should take place the moment we start moving cargo. Keep an eye on the ship's account. If you don't see the payment, hail me. Langsham pulls up the account on a secondary display. Will nods. Ten minutes later, Will watches as the number on the ship's account increases. He nods to himself. No need to call Langsham. From the camera in the cargo hold, he can see the captain heading over to the large party while the crew starts moving crates. 
everyone is involved, even the two engineering crew members, who Will hardly knows. As the crew offloads the cargo, Langsham and the head Holgian watch. The peacekeeper is keeping his distance from them, but not helping with the cargo. Will takes a seat in Langsham's chair, looking at them through the various visual feeds from outside the ship. Rolo and Jax are helping to unload, with a few Holgian pitching in. Olgo is sitting on a crate, watching and, from the looks of it, making jokes. Rolo and Jax are trying to stifle laughs, and it seems like one of the Holgians is too. Everything seems pretty friendly. Langsham and the lead Holgian, meanwhile, are having what looks like a heated discussion. Will zooms in on the feed. Langsham looks mad. That mysterious peacekeeper has moved to stand beside the Holgian crime boss. Will hasn't known him long enough to read his expressions, but he looks worried too. Will pans the view to Olgo, who's not making jokes now. Rolo and Jax have stopped smiling. All three look anxious, as do the other two crew members at the top of the cargo ramp. Will leans forward in the chair. What the hell is going on? Things are looking more and more tense between Langsham and the lead Holgian. The other two Holgians are moving away from the crew of the Reaper. The peacekeeper has also stepped away a few paces and is working his wrist calm. Will looks up at the ceiling. Computer, can you identify that peacekeeper? A small red square appears over the peacekeeper's head, then flashes and stays green when the alien looks up from his wrist comm. Peacekeeper Subcenturion Janus, the sexless voice of the ship's computer replies. Commanding officer of the 5th Strategic Division, 1st Fleet. Will reaches for a button on the panel in front of him to open a comms link to Langsham and the crew, but before he can press it, all hell breaks loose on the screen. The Holgians are running all over. The crew is falling to the ground, writhing in pain. Jax has his blaster out, getting off three shots at the Holgians before falling to the deck. Will hits the button. Langsham! Rolo! Jax! All go! What's happening? All he hears from the other end is coughing and gagging. He can see them on the screen. They're dying. The Holgians seem fine, though, slowly moving out from behind their cover. Commander Janus is still standing where he was before, smiling, also unaffected. Some type of biological agent, then. But how could that be? All six members of the Reaper's crew are dying. But they're all different races. This doesn't make sense. Langsham, can you hear me? Oh God, what do I do? Will can see Langsham writhing on the deck, his hair falling out, his skin turning white. The lead Holgian is standing right next to him laughing before saying something Will can't make out. Olgo isn't moving at all. Reaper. There's a cough. Authorization code. Langsham 43 Bravo 44 587. Another fit of coughing. Wetter now. Transfer all command. Codes to crewman Will. Will called her. Will sees Langsham coughing up blood. Emergency protocol. Run away. Good. Coughing and gagging. Good luck, Will. I'm sorry. The line doesn't cut out, but Will doesn't hear anything more. Until the head Holgian orders his goons into the ship to search it. Oh, fuck. Oh, fuck. On the screen, Langsham collapses. The others are already dead, or at least not moving. Probably dead. Foam is running out of Rolo's mouth. The Holgians are walking toward the ship. Oh, fuck. They have their weapons drawn. Suddenly, the ship is rumbling. The cargo ramp is lifting. And the weapon systems are coming online. What the hell? Will says, startled. The lights on the bridge have shifted to a red color. And the station Jack's occupied, apparently tactical, has come to life and is running through a list of targets. Computer, what's happening? On the screen, the Holgians sent to search the Reaper are tumbling down the ramp, scrambling away from the ship. Will has never actually interacted with the computer, but has no choice but to now. On screen, the ship is lifted off the deck. Self-defense protocols enacted, the voice of the Reaper says. Evasion of capture protocol enacted, Captain. Captain? The ship is lifting up and spinning to face the opening of the docking bay. Blasters have deployed from the underside of the ship and are firing at the Holgians. The shots seem more intent on keeping the Holgians occupied than harming them. The next thing Will sees is that the ship has cleared the docking bay. 
He switches the view aft and sees the Holgians all standing at the edge of the docking bay. The other Ankaran ship looks like it's powering up. With no warning, the Reaper leaps into FTL. Will is standing in the middle of the bridge, looking around as the stars spin and blur. Well, shit, he says, 